All right, awesome. So this evening we're going to take a journey into the Rails router. And if you didn't know, that's a slightly punny title because the thing in Rails that does the routing is called Journey. So m the thing about this is though, most of the topics that we're going to cover this evening are traditionally covered in computer science degree programs. There's, there's like uh, courses even on like compilers and formal language and stuff. But I think we can actually hit a lot of the high points in this like 30 minute presentation. And you can understand a lot more about how some of the nitty gritty parts of Rails work. You can impress your next job interviewer or you can just maybe one day you'll find yourself needing to implement a regular expression engine and you'll know <laughs> at least like where to start. So let's just dive right in. I'm assuming a little bit of familiarity with how Rails works, but not much. I just want to talk briefly about how the router works, though. When you use things like URL4 and Link2 in Rails, that goes through the router to generate a URL. Make sense? The other side, when some, a request comes in, that goes through the router as well. It's basically the reverse. It says, what controller does this route need to be dispatched to? Um, so get slash post is handled by post controller and specifically the index method. Is everyone with me? Is anyone not with me on that point? Perfect. The other thing about this slide deck, I'm going to post both the slides and some of the source code I'll show. So try not to be too like, concerned about getting all the nitty gritty details down. Just look at the shape of some of the things I'm going to show you. OK, let's look at a sample routes file that I've made overly verbose for just demonstration reasons. So we have two routes. One is get slash posts that goes to the index uh, uh, method of the post controller and get post slash ID which goes to the show method of the post controller. Normally you'd use like resources post, right? But I've written them out here for, 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 for verbosity. So audience participation time. If you were writing just like this, the quickest route recognizer you could think of, what, would you, what might you do if you had this routes file and just needed to say, does this URL match any of these routes? I have like a URL fragment. Do, does anything match? Turn those, <coughs> take those parse the colons into groups and throw it through a regex. Yeah, exactly. So basically, the answer was just translate them to regular expressions and loop, right? Like so. Um, if uh, does it match this guy? If so, dispatch to the index uh, method. Does it match this guy? This is just a, like the URL for the ID. It's just something that's not a dot, a slash, or a question mark. I would write a recursive descent parser. <laughs> you know. No, you would not. <laughs> uh, if it matches that, you go here. And then the, if it doesn't match anything, you just return a 404 not found. Any problems with this, maybe in terms of runtime? Anybody? It, it, it's pretty slow, right? I mean, like, you have to part, you, well, there's one regular expression per route. And the worst case scenario is nothing matches when you've already gone through all of them. Um, so it's pretty slow. You, you have to do a regular expression comparison per path. So that kind of sucks. Well, what if we just made one giant regular expression? Would that make it any faster? It actually would. It totally would. Because regular expressions, generally, the worst case time is, is, the, is bounded by the string length. But any, like, the problem here is you wouldn't know what matched. You would just know that something matched. Um, you wouldn't be able to dispatch to the correct controller. You would just know that one of your routes matched. But actually, there's some. Like there's some method of that madness, because this is actually how Journey works. Except what it does is it implements its own regular expression engine, and knows internal state about where the regular expression matched, and based on that state, um, it can dispatch to the correct controller. But what it's actually doing is building a gigantic regular expression, and we're going to talk the rest of this talk about how that actually works because it's super interesting. But we're basically going to have to build a compiler to do it. So hold on tight. And let's do this. If you were building a compiler, the first thing that all compilers do is just break their input up into tokens. If I were to give you like an English sentence and ask you to diagram it, the first thing you would do is break it up into words. You'd probably not even think about it. You'd just say, this, is, this word is a noun. This word is an adjective. Or even just there are words that are broken up by spaces. That's totally what a compiler does when it, when it does this in, in the scanning phase. Sometimes people call it tokenizer phase, you're just breaking it up. And to demonstrate how that works, let's not look at routes, but let's look at arithmetic. So if I asked you to scan this arithmetic expression, 1 plus 2 plus 3, well, I might 
want something like this out of it, and specifically in this format. So let's look at the first character. It's just the number one, and that's a number. So my tokenizer might output, hey, there's a number and it's one. The next character is like literally the plus sign, that's a plus sign, and so forth. A number, a plus sign, another number. Is anyone lost on why this breaks up into this, these kinds of tokens? Sweet. Part of your grammar. <laughs> yeah, we're not there. We're not to grammars yet. We're just to tokens. Here's some code that you can do that um, in, in Ruby with. Uh, and my assertion is that it's super easy to do this in Ruby. Ruby already gives you this thing called string scanner. Oops, I didn't mean to draw an arrow there. but um, Ruby already gives you this thing called string scanner. That's part of the standard library. And you basically give it a string. In this case, like the string here is like 1 plus 2 plus 3. And then you can call this method called scan on it and give it a regular expression. And this is the regular expression for a number. And if the part of the string where the scanner is at the current time matches the regular expression, you get some output in the form of a return value. And then you can output this token, like number. And if it matches like the plus sign, this is just literally the plus sign, you can output the token plus. Does this code make sense, or at least the, or does anyone not with me on why this code outputs the tokens like we saw on the last slide? Great. This is going like much better already than I expected. This is awesome. You all are going to nail this. Okay, let's actually look at how that works in Journey because that's super interesting. So now we're actually in Rails code. If you open up a Rails console in like Rails 4, you can totally type this code and it will work. Um, you can ask, uh, you can create a scanner object, an action dispatch journey scanner, and you can give it a URL fragment, like from a routes file, like this, and then you can ask it to tokenize it or scan it. And here's what that looks like. So again, remember that this is a string we're, we're tokenizing. You can say, hey, what's the first token in it? In Rails' uh, routing tokens, they've determined that uh, they, their, their names of their tokens are things like slash. So it, it literally just ate this first slash up here. The next one is what they call literal, which is just something that has to appear literally, posts, then another slash, then the symbol ID. So we're up to basically here now. We've tokenized, we've scanned all of this. Anyone lost? All right, let's go to the next one. So we've, we stopped right here. So the next token is the left parentheses. The next token is the dot, then the symbol format, and then the right parentheses. And we're at the end. So that's Rails, like real Rails source code running and tokenizing the route that you wrote in your routes file. And even if you wrote resources post, it eventually translates into something that looks exactly like this, and the tokenization phase would look the same. Is anybody lost about how Rails tokenizes the route? Awesome. OK, perfect. The next part, this is the meat of the talk, and probably about the hardest part, but we're totally going to get through it because we're already doing really well. And if we need to stop and clarify things, that's fine. We have a list of tokens. The next thing that all compilers do is apply a grammar to it. So just like if I asked in the English language example, you can see that there are words in this sentence, but not all words can just go together. If I were to make a really simplified version of English, I might say that a noun has to come before a verb, and then like some predicate or has to come after the verb, or an adjective has to come before a noun. This is totally where grammars are, are involved. And even in linguistics, we call them grammars. And in computer science, we call them grammars as well. Thankfully, the grammars we're going to create tonight are much simpler than English. And um, you're, we're going to be able to read them pretty well. And, but but at the, the core of it is that tokens are just a linear list of tokens. We don't know if they're supposed to go together or not. Grammars tell us what tokens can actually go together. And usually, as we'll see also, parsers help us build data structures that are useful in actually executing the, the code we've parsed. OK, let's just dive into an example. That was a lot of words. So remember, we've got an arithmetic expression, 1 plus 2 plus 3. We've already got a list of tokens. Let's see about building a grammar for it. 
So again, grammars define rules, and rules are ways for tokens to appear next to one another. And the key about our grammar is it has to be read from left to right. So we have to start with this character, and then maybe the plus sign, and then the, then the two, and then the three, and then the plus sign, and then the three. We have to read from left to right, and that's super important. It basically makes the, uh, f the parsing algorithm more efficient. OK, so if I were to ask you, if I were to say, OK, 1 plus 2 plus 3 is obviously an expression. We're just going to call this an expression. That might even be what mathematicians would call it. But is there a smaller version of an expression in 1 plus 2 plus 3? 3 plus 3. What about just 1? I mean, like, can 1 stand alone? Probably, yeah. 1 just is 1. And, but it's an expression. It just doesn't, it's not added to anything. So let's say in our conceptual grammar that an expression is, can be just a number. So we're saying, hey, um, grammar, or hey, parser, an expression is a number. But that obviously doesn't cover the entire expression, right? We've like totally, like it won't work for anything other than one. Once it gets to two, it's like, I don't know what to do with pluses. So what might be another way to express what an expression is, building on like one plus two? Operation number. Operation number, yeah. kind of in a clean star. Nailed it. So, exactly. Um, well, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> Don't get the clean stars, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Let's just start with just <laughs> saying. <laughs> yeah. Let's just start by saying that an expression is also a number plus a number. Um, so, this actually works for the 1 plus 2 case. So, we've got, if we parse all the way up to 1 plus 2, we can say that this is expression because 1 is a number. There's a plus sign, and then 2 is also a number. And these are either or conditions, right? So this, these can be either, an expression can either be just a single number or a number plus a number. Is anyone lost on that point? Perfect. And then you can recurse. Yeah, so let's see what the nuances of saying that are, though, because it totally doesn't work. <laughs> so we've said that an expression is a number. I'm pretty sure that's correct. but. Remember, our grammar has to go left to right, and right now we've, are, we've, read from, we've read up to 1 plus 2 and determined that 1 plus 2 is an expression. Now we're trying to read in plus 3, but there's a problem. 1 plus 2 is totally not a number, though 3 is. So does anyone see like the caveat there? We can't mm -hmm. say that an expression is just a number plus a number, because 1 plus 2 is not a number. It's an expression it's plus an three. expression. <laughs> Perfect. So you all nailed it. An expression is actually also an expression plus an expression. And this is where the recursion comes in. And this is a bit crazy the first time you read it, but an expression is actually kind of recursive. It recurses into itself. Eventually, there's a number involved. But this helps us parse 1 plus 2 and then also keep parsing plus 3. Because this part is an expression. And this part is actually an expression too, but it's an expression only because it's a number. Did I lose anyone there? Excellent. So it's a tree. <laughs> you got it. Somebody's read my slides, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So let me. <laughs> All right, sneak, sneak preview. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. So let's look at what this actually looks like in code, because you can actually write this as Ruby code. Ruby confusingly enough, ships with a standard library called Rack. It's R-A-C-C, -C, though. If you know Yak, it's very similar. Um, and you can write parsing rules like this. You can write grammars like this in code. So be most concerned about the shape of this code, not so much all of the, the crazy things that are going on in it. But there's a rule. You just have to write rule. That just tells Ruby you're starting to write out rules. Then you get to name your thing. In our case, we're going to name our thing expression. And you tell Ruby, OK, an expression, this colon just says start the list of things that can be expressions. The first thing is a number. A number can just be an expression on its own. And in fact, if you see a number, create this object called number and pass in the value that you, that you got, the value of the token, basically. It's not important what number does, just that we're creating objects while we're parsing. 
four, that's what the pipe symbol means, just like uh, in, in most, in Ruby itself, it's, it's, not a, it's a, more of a logical or in this case, which would be more of a double bar, but you don't write it that way in this grammar. Or an expression can be, and this again, this refers literally to this expression can also be an expression plus another expression. So that's where the recursion goes on. And this plus is just a token in our grammar. And furthermore, when you see a, a when you parse an expression that looks like this, create a plus object and pass in the value from the left side and the value from the right side. The val sub one is the plus sign, so we just skip that. What this is actually doing, especially this part, is creating a tree like this. When we create plus objects, what we're actually doing is the thing on the left side is a child, like uh, is is a child node like this, and the thing on the right side is a child node like this, and they can be recursive. So this plus on the right side, there's another plus that goes to two and to three, and this right weighted tree is very typical of what you see in grammars written this way, what ends up coming out of them. And my assertion to you is that it's very easy to evaluate this tree and get a result out of it without much effort at all. You basically just walk it recursively um, and it's not, I'm not going to show you code to do that, but we can do it in, on the slides and, and I'm pretty sure you could go write code to do this without much trouble. Did I lose anyone on building a tree out of that, this expression? Okay, cool. <laughs> Maybe this talk is too easy. This is great. Okay. So let's see how you can evaluate that tree. It's when, it's, when you're reading computer science trees, it's mostly easy to read them from bottom to top. So let's start down here. We can evaluate this portion of the tree pretty easily. Two plus three is five. So we can basically reduce that node and just put a five there. <coughs> And then it's easy enough to just do this part of the tree and end up with <laughs> my home. <laughs> yep. That was great. Let's... Now I'm lost. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, back button, will you please work? All right, there we go. I might have to load this again. Okay, there we go. Yeah, we're good. Now you end up with six. So that's the actual correct answer. <laughs> you were asleep. You're not anymore, right? Yeah. This is the great thing about web-based presentation <laughs> software. You might just end up anywhere. Yeah. Okay, so you end up with six. So is that pretty clear how to evaluate that tree, basically, from bottom to top? You end up with a result pretty, straight, pretty straightforward. Okay, let's keep going. Journey's parser basically does the same thing. You can say, hey, Journey, parse me an expression like our route here um, using the parser object. Again, this will work in a Rails console. And then the cool thing about it is you can actually ask Rails to print you out a visual representation of the tree here. Um, has anyone used GraphViz before? You can brew install it. It just outputs this file, and you just type dot t ping, and you get a ping or a JPEG or SVG or whatever you want out of this thing. And it looks like this. Uh, I know this is a little tr a difficult to read, but you can see it has exactly the same shape as our arithmetic parse tree. It's this right-weighted tree, and it's got a bunch of concatenation nodes. These are the circles. So the way you read this is dot concatenated with format. This, that's this part, of the ex that's, uh, this, this part of the expression. And then there's this parentheses node, which means everything inside is, uh, everything below that is inside parentheses. You can see that's definitely true. Then we have this ID node, and that's concatenated with everything in the parentheses. So that's basically this plus this part. And then you just read straight up the tree like that. Does everyone see how this route parses into this tree? Does anyone not see that? Awesome. You all are doing spectacular. But I'm not, when I say that though, please someone stop me eventually and ask a question. But you all are doing great. That was probably the hardest part um, of the presentation, so this is going to go really well. The thing about it though is we resolved our, uh, our tree, 1 plus 2 plus 3, 
directly, but that's actually still an intermediate step for Journey, the Rails router. What it really wants to need, what it really needs is what's called an automaton. And that sounds like a pretty scary term unless you've taken a computer science class and maybe it's still scary if you've heard that term. Um, but it's totally not. We're gonna, it's actually easier than grammars probably. Is, there, is this gonna be a proofs on the test? <laughs> yeah, right. This is totally gonna be on the test. <laughs> Specifically, a deterministic finite automaton, which sounds even more crazy, but it's actually even simpler. Yeah, and I'm going to refer to that from now on as a DFA. Like a bad movie. Yeah, it sounds like a bad science fiction movie. Yeah, totally. But the thing about DFAs is they are the tool that are used to match strings against regular expressions. So if you've ever used a regular expression, at some point you've likely used a, a DFA or something very similar to it. And you can totally write out DFAs for simple regular expressions without much effort. And I'm going to show you one and convince you that DFAs are not that scary. Remember, Journey is basically a regular expression engine. So it's doing all the same things as a normal regular expression engine would, including building DFAs with your routes. OK, this is audience participation time again. Consider the regular expression A star B. Someone tell me in English what that regular expression would match. Anything starting with A and ending in B. Or just the number of A's and a B. Pretty much. Zero more A's and then a B. So the, literally, just B would match, A, B would match, A, A, B, A, 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 B, etc. Okay, let's look at what a DFA would look like for that regular expression. And then I'm also going to convince you that DFAs are really easy to work with in code. Okay, let's look at a DFA. This is what it looks like. When you're working with a DFA, imagine you're a person and you always start out on zero. And then you follow these directed lines to other states uh, as you consume input. So the easiest way to see this is just to look at a string like AAB. We can pretty much tell that's going to match, but let's see why it matches based on following the DFA. So remember, you start in state zero, and then you follow uh, the lines, the directed lines on the graph, and see where you end up. OK, so we're in state 0. The first character is A. There's a line from 0 to 1 that is marked A. So we follow that line and end up in state 1. Did I lose anyone? We don't follow B because we didn't consume a B. OK, we're in state 1 now. Next letter is A. There's this funny loop back one. We stay in state 1 because it's marked A. So we're just sticking around in state 1. And then there's B. And then there's a line from 1 toward 2 labeled B. So we follow that. And we end up in 2. And 2 is a double circle, meaning an accept state. And if you basically, if you walk this string, if you walk this DFA and uh, walk it with your string and end up in 2, the regular expression matches. If you don't end up in 2 or there's not an edge for you to follow, the regular expression doesn't match the string. Is everyone convinced that that DFA is like the same as A star B? Can everyone see that? Or can anyone not see that? So it is a state machine. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a state machine. It's DFA. Correct. Actually, is that the same as A star B? Because you have to have an A in that DFA, right? You don't have to have an A. No, because no, you're supposed to directly start at zero. Yeah. Zero. Okay. Sorry, that was a dumb question. No, no, no. Uh, the question was, do you have to have an A? And no, you don't, because you can go f directly from zero uh, to two. Wait, wait, wait. So, so a, B, A, A star B can just be B? Correct. The A star B can just be B. It's the star means zero or more, including zero. Or including zero. A plus B, right? Yeah. Correct. So actually, the DFA for A plus B would, I'm pretty sure, would just be the DFA without this line. Yes. <laughs> yes. Would the DFA be the same if you just had one to two? Would the DFA? Um, no, because uh, then you would have to have one. Yeah, because, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, the other thing about the DFAs is you usually want to start on, like, a, a, you need to start on a, uh, in, at, at a state zero, and that makes it easier to walk it. Okay, everyone convinced this is A star B? Anyone yes. Not? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me try to not go to Firefox now. OK, let me explain to you why DFA is so easy to use in code. It's because you can totally implement it as a hash table. Um, and specifically, you can implement it as a hash table of the current state you're in, the next input character, and the next state you're going to. So there's basically one row per edge here. If you're in state 0 and the next character is A, you're going to state 1. 
this, that's this edge. If you're in state 0, you get the next character is b, you go over to 2, that's this edge. And then you can, I'm sure you can convince yourself that these next two rows work as well. So if you have a DFA that's implemented as this, like a two-dimensional hash, you can totally write a regular expression engine in like five lines of Ruby. You should totally try it sometime. It, it totally works. You basically just need the state you're in, the DFA implemented as a hash table, and a list of accept states. You just walk the DFA and see if you end up in an accept state or not. And then if, if at any point along the way you have nowhere to go, you just immediately bomb out because you can't go anywhere. Did I lose anyone with the explanation of how DFA is two-dimensional array? Go for it. So will this accept non-A's or B's? No. In fact, the, the question was, will this accept non-A's or B's? And if you're ever in a, on a state and you don't have an edge for a place to go, you just you're, you fail immediately. So if you got like a C, there's just no edge marked C, and you would just fail immediately. So it seems like it would get really complex with the kind of complexity that a regex can be, right? If I'm like looking to see if something matches a, you know, an email address or something like that, it yeah. would be like that hash would be outrageously complex, wouldn't it? Well, right. So the question is, wouldn't it get outrageously complicated for a real regular expression? And the answer is, yeah, it, it totally would. Uh, there might be a lot of states, but that's why we have computers, right? Like, to, so that we don't have <laughs> too much. I mean, a computer, we have a lot of memory these days, and we have a lot of compute power. I mean, a, a computer is going to take, like, a few instructions per walk of the DFA. So it's not going to take that long. I mean, per walk, per, per node walk. So it's really not going to, it's going to be super trivial for a computer to do this. Anybody else have questions on DFAs? OK, sweet. Let's take a look at what Journey does. Journey actually builds a DFA. And you can run this same code in a Rails console and get a DFA out of it. So you can say, hey, Journey, would you parse uh, my route format again? And then you can ask it. I'll explain this later if we have time or if someone asks me. But Rails actually calls it a GTG instead of a DFA, but the distinction is not really that important. Um, but that's what the class is named, so you'd have to literally type that. What does GTD stand for? I believe it stands for Generalized Transition Graph, but I could be wrong. Um, yeah, it sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and you can ask it to also write out a, a dot file for you to use with graph is and, and plot it for you. So let's see what that looks like. So here is the uh, DFA for this route. We can walk it. Let's say a, a request comes in for like slash post slash two, like the second post or the post with ID two. How would we actually, how would Journey simulate that? Well, again, you start out in state zero. You would consume the slash. That's what's on this. Uh, if it's not clear, that's the slash is on this edge. So you consume the slash, go to state one. You'd consume the literal string post, go to state two. You'd consume the second slash, go to state three. This is interesting. This is actually a regular expression on the edge. So if, your, if the next bit of the string matches this regular expression, which is not a dot, a slash, or a question mark, then you go, which and two is not any of those. You'd go over to state four. State four is totally an accept state, so it matches this route. Now the thing, the cool thing about it is there's also this format, right? You can do two.json or two.html or two.csv. So how that's implemented is, well, if there's more string to parse, you can go from state 4 to 5 if you consume a dot, and then from 5 to 6 if you consume a format, and 6 is also an accept state. So it still matches this route. There's actually two, way, two states you can end up with for this route. Did I lose anyone? You went through the first accept state at 4? Yeah. It, it, the accept states, you can actually go through accept states. It just matters where you end up at the very end. You have to consume all the tokens. Otherwise, uh, okay, if there's tokens left, you keep going. If there's tokens left, you, you keep going. And you don't, you actually, there's no, if you look at the implementation, there's, they don't care about accept states until the very end. It's just, at the very end, am I in an accept state or not? Great question. All right, so remember how I said that Journey makes a giant regular expression out of all of your routes? Well, this is how it works. You parse multiple routes. So say this first one, which is like the show route, and the second one, which is like the index route. You build a GTG and or them all together, pass a big array of them. And this is what it looks like. 
So we have now two routes that are represented in this slightly larger DGD. And how does this work? So say you get a request for just slash posts, which would match the, the second one, like the, just the index route. You would go from 0 to 1, consuming the slash. You'd go from 1 to 2, consuming the literal posts. And you'd be at 2, which is an accept state. Um, <laughs> which is an accept state. And the other thing that Rails does now is when it's generating these graphs, it's remembering that state 2 is associated with this route specifically. So it knows state 2 is this route. And it can do that by just, during the combination step, keeping track of which accept states are which. So that's how this whole thing works. If you end up in 2, uh, it matches the next one, or the second one, the index route. But you have a decision point. Say, like, uh, the next token is a dot you would go from 2 to 4 on this path, and then 4 to 6. And 6 is also associated with this one. But if the next token were a slash, you'd go up here, parse and, like consume an ID, and end up in state 5, which is associated with this one. But it's walking the same graph, and meaning that means that it's much more computationally efficient to walk this one graph that has everything combined in it and just see where you end up than it is to loop through a bunch of regular expressions which all do this at the same, like, individually. Correct me if I'm wrong, while you're walking this path, you're also building the options hash. Uh, I actually don't know offhand. The question was, are you building the options hash as you do this? I believe there is some, like, separate um, parsing going on to keep track of, like, to make sure that you keep around the ID as the param and the format as the param. Um, we'd have to dig into Journey to figure out to be sure, but I'm pretty sure you would have to because it would be the most efficient place to do it, for sure. How did you skip the open paren? Um, so the open paren, when it's actually written like this, this just means this thing is optional. So that's just like oh. Rails language for this is optional. And the way it's actually implemented as optional in the GTG is there's an accept state here, and then there's an accept state two nodes past it as well. So you either end up here if it's there, not there, you end up here if it's not there, and you end up here if it is there. But they're both accept states for the same route. Did I lose anyone? Excellent. Let me show you a cool demo. You can totally draw this code in your um, uh, Rails app. I think as a four maybe, this will specifically work. And uh, I actually do want to end up in Firefox this time. You end up with this. Uh, this is actually something you can do in Rails, in a Rails app. You end up with a GTG of all your routes. This is a simple set, I promise, even. It's basically resources posts and resources users. And then this Rails one down here is like built-in Rails routes. Um, so you can see some common themes, right? Like here's uh, posts, right? Uh, and you can see some common themes like a, another slash and then the new route and then like an ID route over here. You can even ask Rails to simulate your route. If you type up here, you can say, hey, what does it look like if I walk the graph for slash post slash one slash edit? Simulate, zoom out. Rails shows you, okay, I walked from state one, zero to one, one to two, two to six, six to 12, 12 to 19, and then you can see this is obviously the, the line that says edit, right? And then I ended up in state 28, which is an accept state. And it, there's a mapping between state 28 and the post edit route. So I don't know. See, see what your Rails app looks like uh, sometime. Can we see what it would look like with a garbage route, just out of curiosity? Uh, I actually didn't ever try that. Let's see what it does. Yep. OK, yeah, cool. So. It, that's really neat. I didn't even try that. So it gets all <laughs> it gets all the way to state 19, and then none of the next edges match, and so it bombs out and says nothing matches. Yeah, that's super cool. All right, so let's wrap up real quick. Um, hopefully tonight you learned some compiler basics. With the first part of my talk, tokenization or scanning, and parsing with grammars, you can write your own simple programming language pretty easily um, with just a little more like knowledge on top of it and maybe some like experience actually using Rack. But you should try it sometime. There's a bunch of tutorials out there. Try building your own simple language or parsing like a subset of Ruby. Ruby, I'm almost 100% certain you can't parse all of Ruby with 
rack because it's too amb ambiguous, but you can parse subsets of Ruby with that kind of parser. Uh, basically, all, um, all compilers have a scan phase, a parser phase, and build a syntax tree. Obviously, only if you're doing regular expressions do you go build a DFA. But um, all compilers for programming languages have at least these first three, and then they might do some other shenanigans as well. Uh, regular expression execution, you can totally go home and write um, a DFA executor and uh, um, execute a regular expression and know actually how that works. And I just, again, like the Rails router, is, this is the third incarnation of it, and the two previous ones were really terrible, um, at least as far as like how you actually could read the code and uh, did, could you reason about how they were going to execute uh, under like worst case conditions or average case conditions? And the answer is pretty much no. There was a lot of dynamic code generation. As far as I know, there's no dynamic code generation in the, in the current router and journey. Uh, so it's a lot easier to reason about. And it, but it took someone, tender love eight, right? Like, t um, to, to be like, what we're actually building here is a regular expression. And how about we just like take all the research that's been done in the last 30 years and like apply it? Um, so while you don't need computer science degrees and like to, to do these sorts of things, um, and we shouldn't, but we shouldn't also scoff at formal methods like we sometimes do. I feel like in the Ruby community because they're super important and have practical applications. But at the same time, no one should be scared about learning these things. Um, there's no, um, you can totally understand these things and you can totally get them and, and, and use them in your real applications. If you're interested in the journey source code, it's actually in the Rails tree these days. Um, it's under like the, the Rails Rails project on GitHub. Um, and it's in the action pack gem specifically, and then it's namespaced a little further into action dispatch. Okay, since this talk's going online, um, it's worth noting that the DFA created by Rails is not really a DFA, but it's super close. Um, it's actually what's called an NFA, um, a non-deterministic finite automaton, and that's because, and we have enough time, I'll show you, there are some routes that are like post slash um, new. Theoretically, post slash new matches two things. It matches new, and then you end up in state 11. And it also technically matches what could be an identifier. And so you end up in state 12. You can't do that in a DFA. Um, you cannot, it has to be deterministic which route you take. This is non-deterministic because there's two routes you could end up with. That doesn't matter that much in practice. It technically makes the worst case complexity like the same as looping through all the regular expressions, but in practice, it doesn't really end up that way. The reason why you can make any NFA into a DFA, but it gets a lot more complicated if you want to go all the way to a true DFA. Like basically this regular expression on this last edge would have to be like everything that is an identifier but isn't literally new. And you could do that and it would work, but it would make the code and journey a lot more complicated when there's not that much like runtime in the average case to gain from it. But since this talk's going online, I thought I would at least like plug that little bit of a thing in there. Um, anybody have any questions? Otherwise, uh, slides here, discuss in the Ruby room, um, find me online, etc. Be happy to nerd out on compiler stuff or sit down. Do <coughs> you have any references you would suggest? Yeah. Um, there are a couple of like college level books. Um, there's one by um, what is the one I used to use? I think it's like formal languages and automata. <laughs> I think everyone uses this book. Yeah, this one. This is the what it looked like when I took the course, but I guess there's a new edition. That one's pretty good. It's a little bit computer sciencey, but it's a good reference book, and it's actually one that Tenderlove <coughs> calls out as one of the books that he used. So that would be a good one. I used the one right below it. Okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, well, it's much many incarnations. Every everybody else. Yeah. yeah. It's all right. Like, they're they're like like books. Books. Textbooks are expensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Don't buy them. All right, Melissa's got a question. Um, this is a well, raw specific. Um, Ruby under a microscope. The first couple of chapters of that book are on uh, parsing and tokenizing nice. in Ruby. So if you want to see um, some other code in more detail or more diagrams, there are a lot of diagrams for you in that book. Awesome. Ruby under a microscope. I haven't read it myself. Awesome.
Uh, do you know how like the current constraints stuff is handled in the router? Is that like separate trees or? That's a good question. So um, the other nuance to why this isn't a DFA is um, you can write arbitrary code constraints for your routes. You can say, I don't know if anyone's ever used this, you can pass, I think, like an object or maybe a lambda or both. Um, so to actually pull that off, I'm pretty sure this needs to be an NFA because you would end up in multiple accept states and then there's a separate mechanism afterward that says, of the accept states I landed in, do they also pass like the constraints that I passed in in code? Obviously, the nuance there is you can tell already it's slower when you do that. Um, so if you um, can avoid using constraints on your routes that are implemented in Ruby, it, it will be faster. Go for it. Do other Ruby frameworks use Journey, or do they implement their own versions of these? So um, the question was, do other uh, Ruby projects use Journey? The answer, I believe, is no, because it's still pretty coupled to Rails. Tenderlove alluded in a previous talk to maybe trying to extract it and make it more generalizable. Um, but there are certain reasons why, um, basically legacy, why it has, there are certain pieces of that that couple specifically to Rails right now. Um, so no, Journey is not easily extractable at this point. Yeah, so, <coughs> I think um, so, so I've, can't you pass a Sinatra instance to a route? And so I remember like reading a Yehuda blog, they talked about that and tried it myself and it worked. And so I'm kind of wondering if that has anything to do with what you're talking about here. Yeah, I'm guessing a little bit, but I'm pretty sure the way that's implemented is like the prefix that you pass to the Sinatra app would be matched in the Rails router. And then basically another like, it would be the rest, the rack request would be passed off to Sinatra, and then it would do another routing phase, basically for the Sinatra app. And I'm not sure how Sinatra's router is implemented, but the first part would be matched by the Rails router. You were you were talking about regular expression. Do you know when Ruby switched to using like a DFA? Because I think it used to use recursive backtracking, regular expression matching at some point. You mean the actual Ruby, like right, the, regular expression. Um, so the nuance with actual like real world regular expressions is they're not at all the same as like what computer scientists mean when they say regular expressions. Regular expressions can do stuff like backtracking and such. So um, the complicated answer about like what does actually Ruby use? It might be a DFA. It might not be depending on like certain conditions. Um, but uh, like real world regular expressions, especially like Perl compatible ones and Ruby, Ruby's one, which is close, are like way more complicated than just a DFA, fortunately. Do we end up having a separate DFA for each of the HTTP verbs? Or do we, is there some other fancy way of handling that? Yeah, the, um, you, like just the, uh, if I remember correctly, I have to look at the code to be sure, but, uh, but if I remember correctly, basically the URL path is matched by the DFA, and then there's additional constraints like what verb was actually used to dispatch to the correct one, controller action. Awesome. Thank you all. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.